So we have a calendar page or you can just search for Prince William Conservation Alliance and you can see we put all our programs up here. After this, we're taking a um, trip across the country, birding the four corners with Larry Mead, an outstanding Northern Virginia birder. And we are offering all these programs at no charge, thanks to the support of our members and others. So we hope that you will consider joining us today, which is right here on the webpage and a form where you can donate safely online. So today we are talking about um, some smart growth tools that Delegate Guzman has made sure are available at the local level. Delegate Guzman represents the 31st district of the Virginia House of Delegates, which spans Southern Prince William County and Eastern Fauquier County. Ms. Guzman currently serves as a vice chair of the Education Committee and as the chair of the Social Services Subcommittee on the Health, Welfare and Institutions Committee. And she's also a member of the Labor and Commerce Committee. And she has put in several bills that have actually definitely caught my attention as helping local communities deal with issues and provide more smart growth tools here for us. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Delegate Guzman. Thank you, Kim. Good evening. Um, good evening to everyone. Thank you for that introduction. Well, as it was mentioned, I, um, I would like to welcome and thank you the Prince William Conservation Alliance for organizing this event with my office. And thank you to my dear friend, County Supervisor Kenny Gori, for joining us. This is the first event that we do together on his new role as an Occoquan Supervisor. And thank you for joining us on this important conversation. And thank you to everyone who has joined us tonight. Uh, for those who don't know me, um, my name is Elizabeth Guzman, and I proudly represent the 31st District in the House, which includes parts of Fauquier and Prince William County. I'm a social worker, a public administrator, a Latina, an immigrant, a union sister, and a mother to four children. But most importantly, I am a fighter, and I'm a fighter for working people, and a, fight, a fighter for marginalized communities, and a fighter for our environment. And in 10 years, when my children asked me, what did I do to save our planet? I want to look at them, and I wanted to be proud to tell them what I have done. So what the first thing I would tell them is that I believe that thousands of climate scientists across the globe who have called on elected officials to take immediate action to combat climate change. And that is why I introduced a resolution that passed the Virginia House that recognizes that we are in a state of climate emergency. And we could have become the first state in the country to declare that emergency. And I will tell my son, Carlos, that I introduced a bill to allow localities to tax or ban plastic bags. He asked me actually to introduce that bill because he wanted to save the turtles. This bill passed this past legislative session as well. And I will tell them that I introduced and passed a bill to study PFAS in our water and create recommendations for acceptable levels to regulate it. And I will tell them that I am a strong believer that we need to fight for a Virginia Green New Deal, for a Virginia Green New Deal, because I know we need a bold change to address the number one crisis of our generation and threat to our species and species. I will tell them that the Sierra Club and the League of Conservation Voters have given me awards for the work I did. And I will tell them that I carry and pass one of the priorities for the Green New Deal Coalition, which I'm here to talk about with you tonight. House Bill 585 was signed into law on July 1st of this year. And this law requires cities with more than 20,000 people and counties with more than 100,000 people to consider transit-oriented development when writing their comprehensive plans. The good news is that Prince William County and Manassas are already ready to do this and they are working uh, with us on getting it, making it happen, the same as Fauquier County. Now, trans when we're talking about transit-oriented development, it's a rather uh, wonkish term for saying, 
because we should plan uh, our communities around public transportation. We need to put thought behind where we build our homes and businesses so that people don't have to drive for miles and miles and sit in traffic for hours and hours. A burning fuel and emitting greenhouses gases. We need to strategize how we can provide people with more travel options, reduce traffic congestion, and reduce emissions of greenhouse gases and other pollutants. And building more dense housing near transportation hubs will help, will help us preserve offered, uh, open space. So my bill provides a few strategies for localities to consider. They can locate a new housing developments, including low income affordable housing in closer to proximity to public transportation options. They can prioritize transit options will reduce overall car carbon emissions. Uh, they can increase development density in certain areas to reduce density in others, and they can employ other strategies designed to reduce overall carbon emissions in that locality. And I also think that it's important as we plan transit-oriented development and as we tackle climate change more broadly that we include communities of color at the table and along every step of the way of our planning process. And, you know, and this is just about, I don't know how long do you want me to speak tonight, but I just, uh, I can, would like to also say a few things about, you know, how, because as Prince William County being a majority minority county, I think it's important for us to just recognize, I mean, where immigrants, one in four, one in four individuals are immigrants in Prince William County. And that's even higher in Manassas and Manassas Park. And I'm one of them. You know, I came here as a 25-year-old single mother from Peru with $300 in my pocket and a little girl. And I will tell you that many first-generation immigrants, when we get here, we don't personally uh, think about the decisions that we're making that could affect the environment and how the environment affects us. We came here. It is the wealthiest country in the world because we believe in the American dream. And you trust that you know America is doing the right thing and taking care of the environment. But later, you know, you learn that we still have to work to do, and that we are a country of means. But we have uh, we are work in progress on making the environment a priority. And when you are an immigrant and you are trying to survive one day at a time, you are just trying to afford to put some food on the table. You are not thinking what is sustainable or organic. You are looking for a place to live and you, and you have to get what's available, even it's, if it's a flood plain or a place with dirty air. This has happened, we know that that happened in Manassas Park when uh, Supervisor Body and I visited the, the mobile home there where more than a third of the population are immigrants. So the homes are not safe in that area they were sinking, but people live there because they need a place to live. So uh, in many places we come from, there is not environmental education. There are not requirements to fight pollution. And if you are working three minimum wage jobs, as I did, to afford a one bedroom apartment, you are not looking for places to recycle. We cannot afford to buy a $20 canvas grocery bag from Whole Foods, for example, or to shop at Whole Foods at all. Many people in our community cannot afford to buy electric cars or even pass the inspection with cars that we do have. And again, that, that is why it is so important that we are strategic about putting affordable housing near public transportation. There is an acculturation process for immigrants, and I just want to share that with you. And we need to remember in the fight for environmental justice that we have to meet people where they are, but we also need to change the culture around driving. Now I understand why people are avoiding public transportation right now with the pandemic but uh, it will not always be this way. We will eventually get back, back to a place where it is safe to be around a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of other people, and we need more people from every socioeconomic class to feel comfortable riding a bus. We need people to ride the metro, which is why I sponsor a budget amendment to study extending the blue line all the way to Quanico. We all need to do our part to change this culture. And it's not just immigrants, you know, there are millions of families who are struggling to get by in Virginia. Many of them, you know, here in Prince William County, but all parents want a clean environment for their children to play in and no family 
wants to get, get sick because of the economic status of where they live. All of these, all of these things, believe it or not, they connect. We live in a country where the law enforcement and the criminal justice system, uh, we have seen that are not working for communities of color. The school are in work, schools aren't working for communities of color. So uh, the economy is not working for people of color and we need to include people of color in our fight against climate change or our planet isn't going to work for people of color either. So I, I would love to partner with you guys tonight to uh, bring more education to our county, to bring more education to these communities in need that are lacking, that lack, are dying to get more resources, to get educated, to get educated and learn more about the environment. So with that, I am happy to take up any questions. Actually, we're gonna let Kenny talk. Okay. Sounds and good. then have a community discussion. Sounds good, thank you again. So let me introduce Kenny Bodie who um, is a member of Prince William Conservation Alliance, and he is serving his first term on the Board of Supervisors representing the Occoquan District. Kenny sits on the Chesapeake Bay Committee for the Council of Governments and has put forward a direction here at the local level to include transportation proposals for review by the Planning Commission, which will, would help link transportation and land use decisions, as well as establishing a consistent point of public notice. So I am going to turn the microphone over to you, Kenny, and thank you for being here. Sure. Thank you so much, Kim, as always, for putting on a great uh, event, which is uh, designed to obviously educate the public on all the great things that we are doing uh, to move the ball forward in terms of conservation, environmentalism, and making sure that we have a planet to pass on to our children and our grandchildren. Um, obviously, uh, you know, first term, you know, three months in, we had a, a global pandemic followed by a recession, followed by a new age of, of racial unrest. But we are still balancing all of that in terms of moving the ball forward in terms of the bread and butter of our county, which is how do we best serve the taxpayers and the citizens when it comes to having a vision, an actual vision for Prince William County. How I see it is, it was always sort of a head scratcher to me on why land use and transportation in our county was always so disjointed and disconnected and unmarried. Uh, why do we have a planning commission which reviews, you know, uh, small area plans, special use permits, uh, uh, rezonings, uh, comprehensive plan amendments, but they don't actually contemplate the large scale road projects, the, the small scale road projects, the smart scale projects, all of these different things that feed into effective land use of our community. You know, why are we always talking about land use and mobility as if they are somehow uh, separate from one another? Because obviously without roads, without a transportation network to bring people from and to their residences, businesses, schools, wherever it is that they need to go and to and from, you know, we don't, we can't have a sustainable community and we can't, we, it's, it's purposeless to, to rezone things if we don't have an actual plan and where to take uh, folks once they leave their homes or once they're coming back home at night. Uh, so the planning commission to me was a perfect fit to review those, those road projects. You know, we have sort of a, an interesting uh, uh, process in the county right now where road projects, you know, they just go through the sort of the staff machine and then sometimes the supervisors in the county government is given some uh, input into where things go. Then just, you know, slapped onto an agenda one day for a board meeting on a consent agenda or on a normal agenda and then we vote on it. You know, the public isn't given very much notice in some cases. Yes, there are sometimes public hearings and things like that, but there's no citizen body right now which reviews transportation. To me, it was a, a no-brainer that we'd put that in the Planning Commission th so they would be able to contemplate both the land use cases and the transportation uh, cases all at the same time in order to really put those things together. Um, I have said ad, ad nauseum, and, and Kim and I have, and Charlie and I have all sorts of conversations about this, um, about the fact that we have been for decades trying to pave our way out of our Northern Virginia transportation and traffic crisis. And decade after decade, we spend millions upon millions of state, local, and federal dollars to just pave more roads. I come from LA. 
I know that you could have eight to ten lanes of traffic going in both directions and you will still get traffic every single day during rush hour. I know that without a true multimodal approach, which includes bikes, trails, pathways, walkability, buses, trains, metro, as Delegate Guzman alluded to, on top of our actual car culture here in Prince William County, we will never get ahead of our traffic crisis and we'll be having the same conversation 30 years from now wondering how it is that we have flying cars that are still congesting up traffic. So with that said, um, I'm looking forward to having a, a robust conversation with everyone on here. You know, we have a lot of, uh, of things coming down the pike in terms of, of looking at real transit. You know, uh, uh, Delegate Guzman alluded to Metro. I was a proud supporter on the campaign trail. And now that I'm elected of getting the blue line extended down here, uh, I'm a proud supporter of VRE, as that's a good medium-term approach, especially with the advent of the Long Bridge improvements up in D.C. Um, but we really need to get a handle on our walkability and our bike paths as well. You know, far too often we let developers, you know, just uh, pave roads and sometimes sidewalks, but we don't really have much thought into trails, greenways, and bike paths to allow people to have interconnectedness without out having to jump into a vehicle. Um, and the final thing I'll say is, as we really move ahead, um, we should never forget the fact that the COVID-19 pandemic has also taught us that a lot of po folks who were originally told that they could not work from home can in fact work from home. So how can we start getting smart about connecting not only transportation nodes in and out of the county, but around the county as well? Because, you know, someone may not want to work from home every day, but if we have, you know, nodes where there's high-speed internet, folks can go to internet cafes, they can go to different hubs within the county itself, they're still going to be spending their money, but we need to be able to get people to and from these places without forcing them to jump into their cars and away from the sprawl that we've had for so long. Um, that said, there is also another directive that Supervisor Le Yesley Vega put in to have a multimodal transportation commission. Uh, I am working with her and our county executive on how that's going to link to my directive. What's probably going to happen is staff is going to come back to us with some uh, uh, recommendations on how to either mesh those or commingle those or, or sort of have those run on, on similar tracks. But at the end of the day, where we want to go, because I also sit on PRTC, is that our community and our county start thinking about real multimodal transportation as not just a luxury or something for the never do wells but for everyone in our community to lower our carbon footprint, lower tra uh, traffic times, and really move the ball forward on having a community where we can all truly w we live, work, and play. So thank you so much, Kim, for the time. Thank you. And we're going to move to a conversation and a Q&A. But first, I'd like to introduce Supervisor Janine Lawson, who is here. And she's represented the Brentsville District for more than one term. So welcome, Janine. Do you have a couple work, you know, comments? Uh, no, other than I really appreciate the forum. I'm anxious to hear more about Delegate Guzman's bill and uh, learn the, uh, you know, the details of it. I certainly support the concept. Um, what Supervisor Bodie said makes a lot of sense to me on land use and transportation. Um, so I just look forward to, I'm going to just do a lot of listening. I'm I'm gonna be in and out because I'm cooking dinner, but I appreciate you hosting the gym. Thanks for being here. No, this is very interesting. Um, so as we start the conversation, I don't know how familiar people are with Zoom, but at the bottom of the screen in participants where you are, there's an icon you can hit to so-called raise your hand, which Tiziana just did. And that is how I will keep up with who wants to talk because I can't have everybody on the same page, on one page at the time. So do you want to start us off, Tiziana? Sure, I'm glad I called dibs. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kim, for uh, hosting this. Thank you, Delegate Guzman, for your relentless work for the environment. And um, thank you, Supervisor Bodie and Supervisor Lawson for, for being here and had a wonderful conversation with Supervisor Lawson earlier too. Um, so anyway, uh, to the question, I know that I, I completely agree that c communities of color and uh, under, uh, uh, under 
privileged communities. Uh, you know, I have so many concerns and definitely don't have time or resources to worry about like climate change and, and all the things that come with it. So how, what, what do you think would, would be the message for them that, you know, of course they care, you know, they just don't have, they just have so many things to worry about. But so what's, what do you think would be effective to reach out to them so that we can, then they decide to participate in this process. And then my question for Supervisor Bodhi would be like, what do you see as a pathway to realizing all the wonderful things that you're saying? And I completely agree with that we need walkable, uh, bikeable, paths and communities. I just came back from Italy a few weeks ago and my god <laughs> how nice to leave the house and just be able to walk everywhere and take the metro everywhere. It was just wonderful. So I wish we could do that here. Uh, thank you uh, Director Tiziana. Right? <laughs> Congratulations on your new role. Uh, well I, I think I touch on, on my remarks, but I could just go in further. I think there it's not uh, news for Prince William County residents when you are driving through the eastern side of the county and when you are driving to the western side of the county, right? So I would love, uh, I think it's kind of late to just preserve green areas on the eastern side. We have what we have left right now. Uh, but what I would say is that we have to meet the community where they are. And sometimes that means that you have to, communi to communicate with them in the language that they prefer. You know, for example, if they are going to, uh, are going to be in the eastern side, so then those who live on the central or western part of the county, we need to go and educate them. Because at the end of the day, you know, what they are getting in school is just the second or third generation but we still have parents that do, you know, once they learn, they care about the environment, but it's just at some point, I think it's competing priorities, right? What you are going to have to make ends meet, if you're gonna have two jobs or three jobs, are you gonna think about, you know, dividing your in recycles and trash, or you are gonna think about buying organic product that sometimes is more expensive. However, when you, start learning about the benefits and how that could not only protect the environment, but actually protect your health, you know, and public health for those who live around you. I think it's extremely important. And I, you know, that's something I know uh, you are an immigrant as well, you know, but we have to partner with other uh, um, or groups like this one and start going out to the communities and start talking to people, you know, and the, the best way that communities a minorities uh, learn is not just by translating our webpage or maybe by, uh, you know, sending out flyers. It's like holding town halls like this one, but in the language that they prefer, they, uh, they love to do that. For example, you know, another important issue since we are not talking about that, we're talking about uh, the coronavirus right now. But we had a hard time, you know, the Latinos were leading those numbers. And when we have gone to that community and we have held, you know, town halls like this one in their language. We had like more than 7,000 viewers, you know, so that tells you that, that this is a way, you know, maybe do it, holding a space like this one where they could actually could do it in their free time while they are cooking or while they are, you know, in their break, while they are working and they, or they can watch it later. They are like, oh, okay. I can tell you, I mean, that I have received hundreds of email thanking me, you know, about what the information that I was shared that it was new to them. So I think I would, I, that's something that we could do. Thank you so much. And yeah, and to piggyback off of that, because I agree 100%, um, something that we did recently on the county level is, is we approved some money to go towards um, really modernizing uh, some of our processes in terms of closed captioning, uh, translation services. A lot of folks who are on here, I, I, I recognize, come to quite a few of our board meetings. They've noticed that every so often we'll have folks where, you know, English isn't their native language. And so they need, need an interpreter or they need a translator. And we've been able to provide that a lot more frequently um, than we were in the past. Uh, that's another sort of, uh, of silver lining of having to adapt to the COVID world. But it's something that we're making permanent in terms of, of bring those services forward. 
Um, I, I've done some work with the school division and help uh, bring some of their processes mm -hmm. over to the, the uh, county side in terms of identifying, you know, the top five or six uh, uh, non-English languages that our community speaks and making sure that not only are we translating all of our uh, our, our materials into those those five or six languages, but also making sure that uh, whenever we post YouTube videos or infomercials and infographs, things like that, that those are readily uh, translatable into those five or six languages. So, you know, when we're even announcing our town halls or our public events and stuff like that, we're getting the word out in the different languages to really go to where people are, as the Delegate Guzman said. Um, in terms of... of you know, bring more people into the process, I think that there needs to be an inside outside approach to that. You know, I, I just spoke to the fact that we are trying to do more on the county side to make us more accessible. We're actually unveiling a new website very soon, which will have the ability to use Google Translate to use not only those five or six languages I discussed, but a whole multitude, you know, dozens of languages. Um, and, and we're building the capability of that. But on the other, the outside of that, like Delegate Guzman said, we need groups like this one to amplify that message. Um, you know, we, we ha we've had some land use cases recently where we've had folks that have never been involved in the process before, not only show up on Zoom, but also show up to meetings. And some of those folks, you know, are from immigrant communities, some are from uh, lower income communities, some are from communities where they just, until recently, didn't even know what the Board of Supervisors was, and they realized, oh, hey, this is how I can get involved. Uh, on a level that really has a lot more impact than even going to my congressman or even, sorry to say it, delegate Guzman, even my delegate, because at the end of the day, it, it's the Board of Supervisors, which really uh, makes the pedal to the metal in terms of those day-to-day -day decisions that affect people's lives. Um, so I would say is whenever, you know, you see these land use cases or these transportation projects or anything that draws your interest or is the interest of a community that you have connection to, let us know or let them know and make those connections. You know, my office is always willing to meet with any community group. Um, you know, I, I've had meetings with, with some of the folks on here individually and in the group, other groups that they represent. Um, and, and regardless of what district they live in, you know, we usually ha have the courtesy of letting each other supervisors know when we meet with their constituents. But outside of that, I'm more than happy to meet with any constituent group to let them know what's going on and to hear from them on what they believe we should be doing uh, moving forward with our county and our community. Thank you. Tom, you have comments and questions. Uh, questions. Uh, thank you, Kim. And uh, Delegate Guzman and Supervisor Bodie, Supervisor Lawson, thank you very much for uh, taking the time to listen to your constituents tonight. For Delegate Guzman, um, I, I've read your, I've read the bill several times, and uh, it, it bothers me because all it says is that cities with twenty thousand, over twenty thousand, counties with over a hundred thousand, will consider strategies, which does absolutely nothing for the jurisdictions that you're targeting. Does nothing for Prince William County. Does nothing for uh, any any of the cities in the county. What, what do you anticipate this simply as a start point and, and what's next? I mean, how can we start getting some teeth in this in our legislation so we actually get actions done? Uh, I, I've been here, I've been working with the local civic association for over 20 years now. And, and quite frankly, we were talking about the same issues back then 20 years ago that we're talking about today. We just have higher speed terms for them uh, today but the environment, land use, transportation, they were all issues 20 years ago. And, and all we've done is add lanes to 95, and that's not the answer. Thanks. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for the question. So what I would say is that um, when the bill came out of the House, you know, there are two chambers in the Virginia Assembly, the House of Delegates and the State Senate. So the house, the bill that came out of the house was a mandate. And it included the, those amounts because we, we wanted the original version of the bill was a mandatory for everyone. However, it could hurt the small localities with uh, cost. And unless, you know, we had the money to give it to them so they could implement these priorities, uh, I couldn't get the money from appropriations approved. 
and even the Virginia Associations of Cities and Counties was against it and working with them is that we put those amounts. So going back to the point where it says May, so the bill goes to the Senate and in the Senate it was amended uh, because I, they didn't like uh, mandates and they amended it as a May. And you are correct, you know, at that point, you know, I had to start thinking about that change may, may take a few years, but I think a start point, it's, uh, it's, good, it's good news. And sometimes we have to build blocks. Uh, however, by speaking with the county, and I spoke uh, with the county of, uh, not the county electors, but actually the department, who work on this, who work in transportation, who work in land development, they have assured me that their comprehensive plans, it's in compliance with this bill already. Thank you. Yeah, and, and, and if I could, um, Tom, I, I, I hear you 100%, and, and I, I, I appreciate your frustration with that, because as I mentioned in my opening remarks, you know, I, I haven't lived in the county as, as long as you have, but I've talked to enough folks like yourself and like others on this call to know that, like you said, the, the, the conventional, unfortunately, because the conventional uh, 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 solution that all the gurus have allegedly come up with is just pave, 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 add lanes, add roads, add more connecting roads, things like that. And we know that doesn't work. Um, what I would tell you uh, uh, separately, but sort of tangentially linked to, uh, to Delegate Guzman's bill is the fact that we are going to be coming up very here shortly with uh, updated chapters for the comprehensive plan for Prince William County w for both the land use and the mobility chapter. Um, in ages past, those were dealt with separately. And again, to get back to my, my frustration with that, you know, folks sort of looked at things one and the other and didn't really look at them th at the same time. I have really expressed uh, my uh, 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 concern with that approach. And I know that the folks in staff have heard me ad nauseum to that. So I know that when those chapters are coming before us, I've been told that they will come to us at the same time. So we can look at mobility and land use as, as, as you know, two sides of the same coin, as opposed to two separate issues that we need to tackle. Um, I have also talked to county staff and made sure that they understand that it won't be like some of our previous chapters where it'll just pop up on agenda one day on our Board of Supervisors meeting and we'll just vote on it and move on with our lives. I want there to be robust, vigorous public input on the, the mobility and the transport and, and land use chapters. I want those to be discussed together. And I wanna make sure that our, our, uh, our mobility chapter in particular uh, talks a lot more than just uh, uh, paving and roads. Um, yes, we should talk about how to connect neighborhoods through roads and other things, but we definitely need, need to start talking about incentivizing uh, 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 re redevelopment and revitalization, which includes bike paths, uh, walk paths, greenways, uh, uh, public transit, those types of things. Um, and to get back to uh, how this connects to the state level, I would love to partner with Delegate Guzman and our legislators to really begin looking at ways uh, that we look at proper laws and things like that to really begin incentivizing uh, transit and transportation instead of just, you know, these large sort of blocks of just, hey, we're going to drop a few road improvements here and there, which we know uh, just sort of perpetuates the status quo. The last thing I'll say about it is um, we have only finally in this county began to talk about revitalization in any significant way. Um, you know, the Route 1 corridor is always sort of used as, as, as the, the monolith there, but as everyone on this call knows, there are a lot of other older areas of the county, not only just on the eastern, but also in mid-county and even some sections of the western end that need to be revitalized. And so how can we work with our state, local, and federal partners uh, to really give us incentives in order to get that done? Um, you know, we are finally getting some deals done with some um, private corporations to, to do, you know, uh, 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 assemblage of lots and things like that uh, to redevelop these large, sprawling, desolate uh, parking lots into walkable town centers um, that will really move the ball forward in terms of, of, of that. But how do we continue to make sure that we're also using the market principles to really make smart growth? Uh, not only something that we want to do, but something that's also profitable to the private market, if that makes sense. 
Thank you. Next, we, Rick Holt, I think, followed by Rita has put a question in the chat that we need to take a look at, and then Sarah. So, Rick. Thank you, Kim. Uh, thank you, Delegate Guzman, and uh, thank you, uh, Supervisor Bodie, for being here tonight. Uh, this is more about the educational side of this because moving people to different transportation modes is, is a behavior change. And so if you look at that, uh, today COG um, looked at reducing uh, transportation emissions by 50%. Uh, transportation for America put out a report talking about transportation being the biggest greenhouse gas emitter. So if you think about those things, that it really comes into our transportation and land use discussion because transportation affects health, the environment, and actually financial too. So I, I think we need to think about all those, but how do we educate people? How do we change that behavior? Uh, if you think about this, because we can have all the modes we want to, we can have density, but we need to help people move from one paradigm to another. Uh, I can tell you in 2008, when I moved here, I drove a car everywhere. And then all of a sudden, three years ago, I was able to sell my car and have one car for the family and use a bike to get everywhere and also use a bike and a bus to get over to my work in Fairfax. So how, do, and that's better for your health. Um, I saved $9,000 a year by not having a car. That's a great financial incentive. So how do we actually help people move in that direction? Because we know it's healthier mentally and physically. We know it saves you money financially. And we also talk about the climate. So how do we move people in that direction? Sure, uh, thank you, Rick. May I ask you a follow-up question of how did you learn about taking that bus from Fairfax that you could bike somewhere and then go and get a bus? Great. Um, so I'm, I'm a transit advocate, so it's a okay. uh, pretty smart look at PRTC's website or OmniRide, and I can see I can take a bus to the Pentagon to go to the airport, or I can take a bus to the, uh, to the metro to, uh, used to be West uh, Falls Church now, to Tyson's. Um, there's bike share all over those locations to use as well when you get closer into the city. Uh, you can use the VRE. You can put a bike on the VRE to get into the city. So I've used uh, probably a half dozen or more modes uh, shifts multimodal to get to either DC or to my work in Fairfax. But uh, even I've even biked over to Fairfax. You can do it. But to uh, Supervisor Bodie's uh, statement, we just don't have the connections. Um, mm -hmm. Biking out of Prince William County is, I say I bike for my life, uh, but so it's, you can say it two ways. I bike for my life in Prince William County sometimes because I'm a little concerned about being on the roads with cars. And then I get to Fairfax and there's actually a trail. So it's a, it's a thing where we need to continue to connect our, our trails and build more trails so people can walk and bike safely. Yes, so that's a very good answer. And I was wondering because actually now I'm serving also as a commissioner on the PRTC. And one of the things that I realize is that there are services available, but um, Com the community actually needs to go and find that information themselves. We don't see that advertising, you know, in social media or in the newspaper, or actually if you want to learn how to, this, to know the schedule of the stops, you have to go to the transit center or maybe look at the schedules that are posted in the bus stops. So I think uh, there are a few things that we have to do. Number one, doing outreach and communicate more about the available options to get out of the county and within the county. Now, out of side of the county, I would say that it's much better than within the county because even when I leave, I moved here in 2000, yeah, in the 2001, and you know where the bus stops have been very similar. I have to walk like about five blocks to get a bus if I wanted to go to the mall, but, but it's it wouldn't be one bus. I have to take two buses. You know, so it will take me about an hour and a half. And then you start thinking about, you know, time is gold. So am I going to take two buses to take an hour and a half or I'm going to drive a, a 10 minute drive? You know, so those are the things that uh, sometimes people uh, think about and that's why they don't, uh, they don't take the, vice, the, the services that are offered within the county. I know that it's maybe, it's gonna take a while to see a return investment because I have these conversations with the current executive director about how we're doing a, a, as far as outreach and communicating. And it's, uh, and the answers that I get is, uh, well, we have this service, but only five people uh, is writing it and then we're gonna remove it. 
uh, because we're, we are going through, I mean, right now with the recession and the coronavirus. And I said, okay, so you have six riders that go every day that use this bus to go to work. If you are going to not longer offer this service, it's six, six families that you are going to hurt. And it may not sound that it's a lot, but it's a lot for those families that will have to readjust, you know, their daily routine to go to work. So I think changes need to be communicated, new service need to be communicated. And as far as getting outside of the, of the county, I think there are great services, you know, there is a ride now that will take you to the Pentagon. There we have buses now from Gainesville that go also outside of the county. And even in Montclair, we get buses that could take you to Pentagon and Washington DC. But it's about advertising that information and advertising once again in a way that communities are going, is going to get to communities. You know, uh, I mean, nowadays, I think the paper that we have left inside Nova and Prince William Times, if you sign up for, but, uh, you know, we had to do it there for those uh, readers, but we have to do it in social media as well. You know, we could advertise it, I don't know, run an app in Facebook to say, new service coming up in Dell City that is going to run at 8, 10, and 12. And then, you know, it's not that expensive, for example, to put something and push it and advertising in social media. And if I think that we can see in our return investment is going to be a long term because we're going to see less traffic because currently, even on the weekends where you want to go to the store, there is no parking. There is not a way to, and then the weather is, doesn't help either. You know, it's winter time. And I mean, some people, you have health conditions and they don't want to ride a bike, you know, in the winter time, it's not safe. We don't have enough, enough uh, biking trails either or routes in the county. So it's about safety. It's about communication. It's about a rich rig. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and, and, what I would add to that is one of the other things that I've, I've learned in my, my relatively short time on the board now is just how disconnected PRTC is from Prince William County in terms of operations. Um, yes, PRTC is a multi-jurisdictional uh, body that encompasses the two cities uh, and a few other uh, localities that go to the south of us, but we are the bread and butter. We are the heart of PRTC from a funding perspective, from a logistics perspective, from all sorts of other perspectives. Um, but we don't really act like it when it comes to our county government. Uh, we, we currently don't really give uh, really very much funding to PRTC from the county government perspective, um, especially when you compare it to how we used to be. Um, but more than anything else, I don't really see us advertising PRTC very much as a county. Uh, we have a, a great new uh, communications director that we hired on a number of months ago. Um, I can definitely reach out to her and talk to her about what we can do to really get uh, PRTC's footprint out there. But I would also turn that on to the folks who, uh, who are on this call. You know, I see a lot of you folks coming to supervisor meetings all the time. Uh, see, see a lot of you taking part in board of supervisors meetings, uh, reaching out to our offices when it comes to land use cases, transportation, uh, road cases, stuff like that. But we have public comment time and PRTC meetings. And we're lucky if we get one person to speak. I know I'm not speaking out of term, but Supervisor Lawson's on the line as well. And that may just be a, a newer thing, but in the three or four years I've even followed PRTC meetings, I've not seen more than three or four people speak. And it's usually on a, a hot button issue like, you know, uh, some of the, the, the work stops we had over the last couple of years and stuff like that. Um, if, if folks really want to see us, uh, you know, really push the ball forward, folks really need to come out to those PRTC meetings and also advocate there because it will give us more of that political cover to push for some of the things that we're hearing on this call. Thank you, Kenny. Um, Rita, would you like to ask your question or do you want me to read it? Uh, I can I can answer it. Can you hear me? I can ask it. Can you hear me, Kim? Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. So um, I was just really excited to hear from Delegate Guzman that uh, our General Assembly did pass a resolution uh, where they do perceive that we have an emergency on our hands here with climate change. 
And I was, you know, again, just reading through the resolution. Um, and it looks as though, again, there's uh, not only a serious acknowledgement that this is a problem, but um, they're, you know, basically declaring uh, that they're going to try to mobilize to halt, mitigate, and reverse um, climate change, basically our carbon footprint. Um, and I just wondered whether or not the General Assembly or um, there's a committee or an advisory group or something, a plan of some sort on how to proceed to do that, to reverse, mitigate, um, and halt our carbon footprint. Thank you, Rita. Very good question. And thank you for, you know, having the, the resolution in front of you. I would go back that this resolution passed the House and unfortunately did not pass the Senate. Oh. Planning to reintroduce it, but I would love for you to call your state senators and tell them that this is something that you believe in. You know, and I am not here to speak uh, negatively about anyone, but I think that as uh, their constituency, they, your voices need to be heard. Mm -hmm. I'd love, you know, for this group to know who your senator is and let them know that this is something that uh, you guys support. So mm -hmm. we'll reintroduce it. When I, the, here, it passed the House and then it went into the Senate and in the Senate, uh, they said that because there was um, a line that refers also to call the White House to act, to take action because of that, that they don't, tr they don't hear those types of um, call to actions to the federal government. It's something that is not part of their business, even though, you know, that cleric saw the bill and she docketed because sometimes when it's germane, you don't put it on the docket, you know, and do, then you go and reach out to the patron and said, hey, according to the rules and bylaws of the Senate, this bill cannot be heard. They share that information to me at the hearing that didn't give me the opportunity to revise or amend the bill. It was really fast. It was like close to the end of session and it was on a Friday, but that doesn't mean that I want to stop fighting. That doesn't mean that I'm coming back next year and I'm going to introduce it again. So I would love you guys support uh, to call your state senators and tell them that it's something that you guys support. Thank okay. you. Okay. Well, thanks for that clarification. Thank you. Comments to add, Kenny? Okay, then we'll move to Sarah. <clears throat> thank you, Kim. First of all, um, thank you, Delegate Guzman, for showing up to this tonight. I haven't read the whole bill, but I'm very aware of it. I've read some of the paragraphs, and it sounds like we're on the right track. I also th want to thank um, Supervisor Bodie and Supervisor Lawson for showing up. Okay. Um, now this thing is about land use and transportation. And I do admit that I have a concern when, when we're talking about land use. I'm just wondering if uh, the developers are, or something, I don't know how I'm gonna put this, please bear with me. I'm afraid about land being torn down that may have some transportation rail on it in the future. And that land will be torn down and destroyed without any wherewithal. It seems that we're not very good with using the resources we already have. I do know the developers just don't want to use stuff that's already there. They, they want to tear stuff down, which really upsets me and part of why I'm, I'm mostly why, why I'm on the citizen advocates. So what's to prevent too much stuff being torn down? Um, my other concern is I'm really not sure the citizens really get heard. I've never even heard of a PTRC meeting. I don't use it myself. And I do show up um, on the Zoom and in the, and in the, and then the McCorrick building when I can. Um, but I really just don't know how much the citizens' voices really get through. That That is my concern. And I do want to give a special shout out to Supervisor Lawson. Uh, when, uh, when you and Supervisor uh, Vega came up to the Yorkshire Elementary School after a long day and spoke to us. I thought that was great because that was personal. That was getting with the people and the meetings that you've all been doing with the, uh, the, the people in the, in the uh, can I say trailer park? That's not derogatory, is it? 
um, and getting out and reaching the people. So anyway, uh, those are my two concerns. One, tearing down land for a possible uh, transportation system that may or may not work. And two, uh, making the citizenry's voices be heard. Thank you for letting me speak. Sure. So I think I'll go first with that one, if you don't mind, Delegate Guzman. Um, I, I will say, uh, Ms. Jens, I appreciate you you, you, you uh, airing that to me and to, to the rest of us. Um, the first one, in terms of tearing things down, I spoke to that a little bit earlier when I talked about revitalization. Uh, um, you're, you're right. Unfortunately, how things are set up right now, especially in terms of our county, uh, developers make a lot more money and a lot more profit going to verdant land uh, that hasn't been paved over or done anything with, clear-cutting trees, terraforming that, and building something from scratch. That's just frankly how it works right now. Um, part of that is because folks in the past haven't really pushed back about it, but also we've just never really sat down and really talked through how to incentivize doing things another way. Um, you know, we've grown as a county exponentially in the last 20 years. I don't have to tell anyone on this, on this call that, but in that sort of rush and how folks sort of just look at the now, there hasn't been much consideration given to how do we uh, uh, go back to areas that have already been uh, uh, developed and how do we really uh, give developers tools to do things there and change the dynamic and, and really uh, uh, shift things in a different direction. Um, I'm not a, a, a I'm not a big believer that we should be you know taking verdant land and, and converting it when we have as I mentioned before uh, you know desolate wastelands of, of paved parking lots and strip malls and things like that I I don't believe that we should be going to to new areas of the county that haven't been uh, uh, really uh, uh, looked at before and and you know getting rid of green open space in favor of, of high rise apartments and things like that. I believe that what we really need to do is, is really go back to the drawing board and looking at some of the tools that we've already started to put into place, um, at least in some parts of the county, in terms of, like I said before, giving incentives to developers to assemble lots in developed areas, uh, uh, bring those together, and convert some of these large, sprawling strip malls into uh, bigger, better communities that have more walkable space in them, less just paved over uh, 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 parking lots and really showing them that they need to be looking at those areas as opposed to the verdant land. Um, what I will also tell you though is when it comes to that is as we look forward at the new land use chapter, we need to have strong language in there. And, and so when uh, developers come and even do applications to us, we need to be uh, uh, putting strict teeth into how we do environmental analyses and making sure that we front load a lot of the uh, application process to make folks do those impact studies and analysis before they even come before the planning commission or the board of supervisors. Because if we put in a lot more of those uh, uh, guidelines and regulations, it'll be less uh, uh, profitable for developers to just go and, and ruin or develop uh, air, uh, you know, green land and green space than it is to go and redevelop somewhere that's already been uh, uh, developed. What I will also say in terms of that is you uh, sort of touched upon it when you just talked about your own experience, when you said that you hadn't even really heard of PRTC before tonight. You know, that may just be because you haven't needed to take a, a, a local bus anywhere or anything like that, or we have a branding issue. Um, regardless of the reasoning, we have to really talk to the community and ask folks like yourselves and people on this line, have, it, have you heard of PRTC? Do you know what PRTC is? Do you know what OmniRide is? Do you know that there are buses that can take you not only in and out of the county, but also around to other parts of the, of the county? You know, how can we really get folks to, to be aware of these things? And once they're aware of them, how can we get you guys to advocate not only in calls like this, but like I said before, coming to PRTC meetings? Um, things like that, because um, we, we can, you know, 
we have a really strong activist core that will come to BOCS meetings and will send us emails and things like that. But when it's time to actually talk to our agencies, like our transportation department and things like that, and, and, and sitting down and working through some of these complex issues, folks either frankly don't have the time or they don't have the tools. So how can we help empower you all is the next question to really uh, uh, help us help the community. And that touches upon your second aspect is how people are heard. Um, and, and far too often, you know, this is on the county, it's also in the state side, but it's also very much on the citizenry. We are always so much ready to be reactive to things. Um, you know, I see upteenth emails about, you know, the birds are at Long Branch now uh, since it's coming up on Tuesday. Now, there's been a lot of good uh, outreach in terms of supervisors talking about it for a, a, a good while. And this is a project that's been on the books for years. But, you know, when it comes to other things that we talk about, I'll give uh, the, the parks uh, master plan as an example, which was before the board uh, uh, recently. You know, I didn't hear anyone talk about that. We didn't really have very much citizens outreach. It, and it had been on the agendas quite a few times. I'd even send on a newsletter to folks saying, hey, this is being talked about. Give us your feedback. No one said anything. Um, so I, I, I'm definitely here to hear from folks. But it seems like uh, a lot of folks really only start to make their voices really, really heard when they feel there's a sense of urgency. And I get that's human nature. But my, my question to folks on this call is, how can we make it easier and more accessible to you guys to make your voices more proactive before we're in that sort of week before it's on the agenda sort of thing? I think that um, supervisor body uh, touch on what it has its concern to the county what I would like to add is that I think the three of us who are here today, elected officials, the three of us serve as commissioners on the PRTC, and we meet the first Thursday of each month at 7 p.m. I know uh, we have been meeting remotely and it's been, uh, you know, and there is a link for YouTube so you can watch the meetings. And the last thing I think uh, I could say that none of the projects should happen without constituency feedback, even when it has to do with a project that where we have to use state money or NBTC money or MBTA money. All of them are mandated to have public hearings where that, and include the public opinion when they present their, um, their plans. However, that's another problem, that when these meetings are not advertised, in the right uh, channels or media where people don't know when those happen. So like, for example, and I'm just gonna share something that happened in Fauquier County. Uh, we had a project for years that it was to get rid of humps on Route 29 because we had many accidents. Fauquier Fauquier residents in Prince, uh, were waiting for many years for that to happen. So we finally got the money, the money was allocated and BDOT wanted to start the, pro the project. They provided a presentation where feedback had to vote, where, I'm sorry, constituents have to vote whether they like that option or not. So they were not well attended. There, I would say probably 50 people attended because I attended myself during the voting and the presentation. But then when they presented a plan and they put it on the newspaper, then people started knowing about it. And the reality is that most of the constituents, if not all, were uh, not in favor of that project. So we got the money and the public spoke and I was able to mediate and hold those conversations in between the local government and between the Virginia Department of Transportation and the public. The first town hall and I advertised it everywhere I could, you know, even in the schools and we got 200 people showed up and people were talking to Vida loud and clear that that's not what they wanted. And they were forced, you know, to change uh, the strategy that they have to build. So I don't want you to think that uh, I don't know what is happening, you know, what is the status of the new developments that are happening here in Prince William County. But one thing that I could tell you is that there is never late to have constituency feedback. 
So, you know, I would uh, tell, you know, the county supervisors, you know, on my role, if uh, we can work together and facilitate, you know, meetings where we could hear to the public, where we could work with VDOT, we could, we could work with the Prince William County Transportation and MBTA. So they hear, they hear the community and they have to do what the community wants. Thank, Thank you. you. Carla, you have a question? Yep, I'm here. Good evening, everybody. Um, I just had a quick question um, for Kenny Bodie. I know there's a project coming up before the board on Tuesday. I think the project itself really conflicts with a lot of what uh, Delegate Guzman and uh, Kenny, you guys have been talking about tonight. It's the preserve at Long Branch. For that project, there's no access to transit in the proposal. I really don't think it's environmental friendly. Currently, that property, it's a beautiful forest. I've got friends that live in that area. Quite frankly, they're going to, they're really, really surprised that it's in front of the board again as being seriously considered because I think it's developers like sixth or seventh time trying to put that through. And none of the houses or anything that they're building there, it's nothing low income. So I guess my question for you, Kenny, will you be supporting or opposing the preserve at Long Branch for the CPA and the rezoning? So that's a great question, Carl, and I appreciate that. Um, I've gone back and forth with this project because I'll tell you that when it was originally proposed, uh, it was way too dense. Um, and as you said, there was like no, there was no consideration of transit or transportation. Uh, it, 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 you know, it gets billed in some ways or another. And it's partially in the rural, it's most in the rural crescent right now. And part of the plot of land is in the development area. Unfortunately, with how it's configured and how, how it's buildable, the part that's in the development area is not really getting developed at all uh, for the most part. Now, the developer has done some things, lowered the density a little bit here and there, uh, made some concessions in terms of transportation. They're, they're offering generous proffers and things like that. Um, and, and as most folks on here know, uh, one of the ways that they've tried to incentivize it in terms of, of the public and the, the supervisors is they're going to be uh, donating a large portion of the land, including an assemblage they made to Dove's Landing uh, north of the, uh, of the property, uh, to become parkland, a passive use, uh, 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 you know, sort of trail system park. Uh, you know, as of today, there's been new developments that have made me even more concerned about it, where I'm, I'm a lot less likely to support it than I was in the past. Um, and, and, you know, if this was a mile east, more into the, it was entirely in the development area, we'd be having a much different conversation, I think. But ultimately, we have to look at land use is about where are we putting what, where, why, how, and to what benefit for the public? And to, to me, right now, there's too many question marks with the, the, uh, the preserve at Long Branch and the precedent it sets, or I should say the precedent it continues, which is we've had other CPAs in the past that have done similar things, or at least those CPAs have added some land back to the rural crescent when this one does not. Um, and so I'm, I'm not in a place right now where I, I really support it. Uh, you know, we're still talking about it. I, I've been talking to developer for the better part of months about it. I know our planning commission has denied it. I know that our planning staff has recommended denial. Um, so I'm not in a place where I, I really want to say I support it at all. Uh, but I would say is that we need folks to continue to talk to us about this. Um, and like I said, I don't support it, but what I will finish by saying is, and I brought this up at a, at a recent board meeting, currently how we're doing things with these land use cases is not working. And I say that because right now, one of our only mechanisms of preserving parkland and open space or getting trails done or really uh, having anything ceded to the county to do things with in terms of conserving green space is through the development process, is through the land use process. We currently do not have a dedicated funding stream to make a, an, a, a conservation trust, for example, 
which can help us from a county perspective to do things. We have language on the books for a PDR program, a purchase of development rights program to help with that, but we currently have no funding mechanism for it. Um, we don't have a council or any sort of citizen involvement with that to really move the ball forward in uh, 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 identifying properties and projects to use for a PDR program. We just don't have any mechanisms from a county public perspective to conserve parks and green space right now in any, any substantial structure organized right way. Now, in the bond referendum last year, we did uh, ask the voters to authorize us uh, X number of millions of dollars for green space and for greenway. That's great, and the, the public, you know, voted on that overwhelmingly. However, no funding was identified for that. So we still have to figure out as a community how we're going to fund that. And the problem we have is that it, it go, we have, then we have a back and forth conversation on how we pay for this. The only way we can pay for things when it comes to green space, parks and open space, environmental concerns, anything, is we either need to raise revenues or we need to cut spending in other places in order to pay for it. Or we need to find savings somewhere. And unfortunately, I still have not seen from the public or even from fellow supervisors the willingness to really have a real conversation about that. Now, I will grant everyone on this call and my colleagues the fact that we have a pandemic right now. But we will never, ever move the ball forward on really being able to say as a community, no, Mr. Developer, you need to go pound sand because we don't want anything you have to offer when they offer us proffers that give us parts because we don't have anything to do currently ourselves on how to really move the ball forward. And we need to figure out how we're gonna do that. Um, so what I would say is, how do we get from the problem to solution? Yes, if we tell you know the folks that are trying to develop the Long Branch uh, to pound sand, we also need something positive to talk about too. We need uh, to come up with a plan. The land use chapter is a good start, but budget season is not far off. We've already started talking about you know projections on what the budget looks like for the 2022 budget cycle. We need folks on this call to not all, to always only be about, I want low taxes. We need you to tell us what you believe our, your, our funding priorities should be. And if parks and open space, environmental concerns, all those things, you need to be able to advocate that to us because we need to hear that. We can't just always hear, don't raise our taxes. We need to hear what you want us to spend your taxes on. Kim? Yep. Can I... Can I just kind of uh, piggyback on that? Absolutely. Um, so one of the programs that has been referenced, I believe by Supervisor Bodie, um, and I saw that Elena posted a comment in the chat section, which is spot on, is the purchase of development rights program. And it's part, it's one of the recommendations from the Rural Preservation Study that the board, gosh, four years ago, uh, told county staff, okay, we like this idea, this concept, uh, continue moving it forward and bring it back to us. Uh, so we haven't formally adopted the purchase of development rights. I'm a, a big proponent of it. I think we need to put our money where our mouth is. Uh, one of the funding sources could be the rollback taxes from the rural area when, you know, um, when the land is, is rezoned. We've had farms that have been developed into buy right 10 acre lots and those landowners have to pay five years of rollback taxes from from the reduced tax rate so that that could be a funding source and um, we certainly have to look at other areas of funding transfer of development rights is another um, proposal that i support I'm more supportive for sure of the PDR program. I need to learn more about the fine details of the TDRs, but um, I absolutely believe like Supervisor Bodie, we've got to find new tools in the toolbox to preserve our rural area and preserve it without this, you know, uh, Trojan horse of clustering in the rural area with the sewer lines. The sewer line is key to um, 
really preserving the rural area. And if the sewer line comes out, breaks, breaks that barrier, then I'm afraid that we'll lose it forever. So um, great question, Carla. I'm glad you brought that, brought that up to next Tuesday night. It's a huge vote and it will be precedent studying. And um, anyway, I, I look forward to the rural preservation conversations in the future. It'll be really important that people come out and support the PDR. PDR purchase of development rights. PDRs also, you know, have a more widespread um, function. I see Julie here, and I wonder if I can impose on you to tell the story of the ice cream shop in Fauquier. Um, sure, I'll, I'll try to tell a, a short version. Um, but yes, there's a large uh, agricultural. Uh, uh, enterprise in Fauquier County, Southern Fauquier near, near Remington, Virginia. Um, some of you may have passed it on Route 29 going south towards Charlottesville. Um, it's called Moo Through. And that farmer was only able to put that shop in place uh, because of Fauquier County's PDR program. Because basically what it does is it, it pays the farm, farmer for those um, development rights and puts money in their hand immediately and then they can reinvest those funds back into the, the agricultural production. Many of the farmers put it into their facilities, their barns, things like that. This farmer decided he really wanted to start up an ice cream shop and it's been a huge hit. So it's very successful. Thank you, Julie. And it's maybe worth noting that the comprehensive plan now has recommended a PDR program for probably close to 15 years. And, you know, with no forward motion on that. So, and the Rural Crescent study, the survey that was associated with that, one of the questions on it asked people if they supported a PDR program and were they willing to pay? And the responses were um, yes, in the majority. Anybody else? Oh, Randy. Thanks, Kim. Um, a lot of the discussion tonight is really focused on how do we disincentivize or regulate development to avoid dumb growth. And I guess I'd like to ask Supervisors Bodie and, and Lawson, um, what do you regard as the top two or three opportunities in Prince William County to incentivize smart growth? How, how can we get the developers on the right side of the the issue here. Thank you. I'll, I'll defer to Supervisor Bodie because uh, this is really his, more his form unless he wants me to go first. I'm looking for him. I don't see him. Oh, he's back. Uh, the computer Supervisor room. Bodie, did, did you hear my question? No, for some reason, right as you started talking, I got really bad lag, so I decided to try to fix that and end up just kicking me out of Zoom altogether. So can you please repeat that? Sure, I, I will. And I'll also tell you that uh, um, you bailed out just in time for Supervisor Lawson to say, I'm going to turn that one over to Supervisor Bodie. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> Anyway, the, the question was this. Um, a lot of what we've been talking about is how to either regulate or disincentivize developers in order to avoid dumb growth. Um, what do you see as the top two or three opportunities in Prince William County to incentivize smart growth? How, how do we get the developers on the right side of the issue? Thank you. So that's a great question, Randy. Um, and I, it's always great seeing you on these calls and being able to talk to you about these issues. Um, one of the ways that we've started already incentivized better growth is through the uh, Industrial De Development Authority. And that's uh, a, a sort of semi-separate uh, authority from the county whereby we're able to allocate funds to get uh, economic development deals together. Um, and we've been able to use that even since the beginning of the year to, as I said before, uh, give folks some of the economic tools they need, grants, loans, things like that, to do assemblages of parcels 
um, you know, get some seed money for certain things that they're trying to do uh, to really uh, uh, revitalize and change some of the ways that they're doing things. You know, we have a project that's on the Route 1 corridor, for example, that we were able to, to get done recently that we're in the process of. Uh, uh, where we're able to get some assemblage done there uh, and, and really go from a, a large sort of desolate, large, older uh, uh, parking lot uh, strip mall into a nice uh, 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 walkable, uh, what hopefully is going to be more of a town center concept. And it's right next to a transit node. It's in one of the small area plans. So it's planned properly for that. And all uh, some of the folks in the private in the, in the uh, corporate community needed was some seed money and some um, financial backing in order to, to get get the process started. That's one. Um, two is as I alluded to earlier, us writing policies such that uh, uh, folks realize that we will be more favorable to their projects if they work in the policies that we dictate as a board. You know, the land use chapter and the mobility chapter are on the docket to be redone. Um, and, and part of the why that's important is it also allows in the front end county staff to talk to these folks at the beginning of the line before they spend time and months and money and hire land use lawyers and all this other stuff for them to say, hey, if you want a snowball's chance of getting your project through, here's our, here are the things that the board is looking for. If you don't do these things, you're probably not going to get very far in the process. And I know that sounds like disincentivizing, but to, in a way, it's also incentivizing because if we give the development community a, 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 a uh, menu of things that we're looking for in these areas of the county and tell them, if you abide by these rules and you check all these boxes, you'll be given a, a efficient, streamlined track through the approval process and updating those zoning uh, uh, and designations from the comp plan to make so they may not even need to go through uh, a rezoning or a CPA or go through the rigmarole of having to go through the planning commission and through us, that saves them money. If they have to spend a lot less time and money hiring land use lawyers and going through the permitting process outside of just the normal process, that is going to put them in a more trajectory toward going through what's already there. Um, the final thing I'll say is, um, you know, Supervisor Lawson touched upon it even more, and I appreciate her commentary on it. One of the things that we can use uh, through a PDR program is getting outside funds to help uh, folks do better by investments when they use PDR. And what I mean by that is there are state and, and federal uh, trust funds that will give us matching funds, which we then can use to allow folks to, to really reinvest in, conserva in conserving what we have. So on one end of the equation, we incentivize people looking at revitalization of what's already developed in the county. On the other end of the equation, we also incentivize folks using PDR programs and conservation easements and other tools to give them the financial backing they need to, to transfer funds so, so we're in a better place so folks who already have, you know, parks and green space, ag businesses, agritourism, agribusiness, they're able to get the, the seed money they need to really build their 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 their, uh, their wealth there, as opposed to being more susceptible to the big developers that we see fall, they're falling prey to. That and that's the last thing I'll touch on. Part of, and I, I'm sure Supervisor Lawson can speak to this a lot better than I can. Part of one of the biggest issues we have and challenges we have as a county right now is we have a lot of landowners who have owned their land for generations. Farmers, uh, 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 you know, uh, folks that have uh, inherited estates from their, their forefathers, what have you, that they don't necessarily want to keep that land anymore. And they, they're sitting on this land and they want to do something with it. They either want to sell it off to a developer, they want it turned into something. But unfortunately, the only people right now that have the financial means to make them a deal that's worth their while are the large development companies that want to do the large-scale residential development that a lot of people don't feel like is, is in the best interest of the county. So how can we make sure that we're bringing in money from other areas and incentives from both the public but also the private sector 
to make sure that they are given other options other than just going to uh, these developers that give that sell them a bill of goods all the time. I hope that answers your question, Randy. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I can just touch on it quickly. Um, Supervisor Bodie said a lot and made really good points, agribusiness, agritourism, uh, the incentivizing redevelopment like the Route 1 corridor that he mentioned are, are excellent tools. Um, you know, we really need five strong votes on every Tuesday to defend the rural area. And, um, you know, it's been a struggle having five votes, five reliable votes uh, over the last 20 years. Um, so I think that that Rural Crescent, it, the Rural Crescent is by far the greatest tool that we can have to to manage growth and direct developer, developers to the proper area. Um, for the most part, it's worked, but there's certainly some hiccups that we've had to deal with along the way. Next Tuesday night's a, a big concern of mine. Um, but Julie, thank you for your excellent example of Moo Through uh, back to the PDRs. I think that that could be a huge win-win for everybody moving forward once we formally adopt the PDR program. But the last thing I'll kind of throw out there is a bit alarming to me, and I'm thinking Supervisor Bodie may not be aware of this. Um, so Kenny, if you're listening, brace yourself. But um, I'm hearing that that the chair is now supportive of data center complexes in the rural area. I've got some large landowners in my district who met with me um, a week or so ago. And um, I, I can't wrap my head around putting data center complexes in the rural area, but they indicated that they had the chair support. So that's going to be another battle that we're going to have to take on for um, the rural crescent. It won't just be higher density develop residential development. It'll be data center complexes. Thank you for cheering this up, Janine. And <laughs> Sorry about that, Kim. <laughs> um, for, <laughs> I guess it's time for a glass of wine after this. Um, Rita, for our, as we end up. Yeah, I just, uh, I put some information in the chat that I just wanted to speak to. Um, there's an amazing video that um, I think everybody would appreciate seeing. Um, and it's, um, the speaker is Tony Saba, who talks about the future of transportation. Um, he's a professor at Stanford University. Uh, but what he said was essentially we're in a market disruption and he really thinks <clears throat> that things are going to move quite quickly from regular cars that use gasoline to electric vehicles and that electric vehicles are the the transportation costs are going to be so cheap that we're going to eventually be seeing businesses like Starbucks providing free transportation to people who are commuting into DC, and then will sell them their products during that transport. So it's 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 just a really um, awesome presentation that he did. Um, so I would er, I put the um, I did put the link in the chat as well. Uh, it, I unfortunately, accidentally sent the first part before I could get in the link, but it is in there. Um, the other thing that I wanted to ask, and it might be that Supervisor Lawson might be more in touch with this, but I also saw um, a film uh, called Kiss the Ground recently, which was um, really uh, an eye-opener for me about how we can reduce our usage of fossil fuels, but the carbon that's in our atmosphere is still there and is a, to a high degree and that um, we are going to have to try to come up with a solution for getting rid of the carbon and the one way to do that is through agriculture um, and they talked a lot about regenerative agriculture they're basically 
um, working towards the health of the soil. A lot of the, the ways that uh, farmers now farm the land, um, in fact, releases a lot of carbon into the air. And so there are certain techniques that a person can follow uh, that will keep the carbon in the soil. And I just wondered if there were any, if there's anybody in our county who is in fact farming along the, these lines. Uh, I'm curious, is this um, on Netflix or yeah. I'm not, does this also talk about uh, the natural healing components in the ground? Is this the yes. same? Well, yes. I haven't seen it yet, but somebody recently mentioned it to me, so I, I wrote it down to be sure to watch it. Yeah, it's, it's really super good, very well done. Um, but um, I, I think that here in Prince William County, because we do have so much farmland, mm -hmm. that we are sitting in a good position to uh, pull some of that carbon out of the atmosphere. And uh, it ends up being a win-win all around because it's a cheaper way of farming. Uh, it, you know, it, it grows um, superb produce. The produce is of higher quality uh, than farming in the old fashioned way, if you will. It's very, it's very good. So I would urge people to, to watch that film as well. I will check it out. Yeah, me too, Rita. I appreciate that. And what I would also say is, is on sort of the flip side of that, um, I think it might be in your district, Janine, but I'm not sure that hydroponics farm that, that we all visited that one time. It's in uh, Gainesville. Yeah, it's in Gainesville. Okay, it's in Gainesville. But yeah, um, you know, there are some folks that are doing some very innovative things in terms of hydroponic farming, greenhouse farming, things of that nature as well. Um, and what I would say is to go back a little bit to something we discussed earlier is one of the, the other things that's in the uh, rural preservation study that I think has at least some uh, 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 broad support uh, is is the uh, the the overlay district, and and you know there's arts and tourism stuff in there, but there's also us talking about incentivizing agribusiness, agritourism, things of that nature, and and my thought is that you know not only uh, establishing those incentives, but marketing the hell out of them once we have them, because I'm a big believer that we. Once we incentivize something and we market it properly, the private market will also respond to that. We will have entrepreneurs, you know, homegrown and even from neighboring jurisdictions who will be interested in, in uh, utilizing those incentives to do things like that. And if we're able to sort of, as we talk through uh, the process of folks establishing their shop or their farm or whatever it is in, uh, in the county, we can obviously engage them on those best practices in terms of, of not only being uh, carbon friendly, but even in, uh, 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 utilizing carbon and taking it out of the atmosphere so we're better stewards of the, uh, of the environment. So, you know, I'm all for, for that. And I think that's yet another reason why, uh, as Supervisor Lawson mentioned earlier, we do need to have a, a robust con conversation about the rural preservation study and the findings we want to take from that to move forward. Thank you. So I think we're going to wrap up now. I believe that um, Delegate Guzman has been kicked off. Maybe we and she had um, another call. I'm sorry. She said she had another call. Oh, okay. I missed that. Thank you. But we certainly appreciate her being here, and I will express our thanks tomorrow. And thank you very much, Kenny and Janine.